Hi, and welcome, everyone. I'm Tim Ogden, Managing Director of the Financial Access Initiative at NYU Wagner, and I'm here today to talk about building inclusive financial systems with Luz Urrutia, who is CEO of Acción Opportunity Fund, a micro lender serving the United States based in California, Leora Clapper, an economist in the Development Research Group at the World Bank and leader of the Global Findex, and Tunde Kahinde, founder of Lydia, a fintech serving small businesses in Africa and Europe based in Nigeria. Leora, I want to start quickly with you because the question of financial inclusion always comes back to data, who is included and who is not. And Global Findex has uh, mapped inclusion uh, globally. And over the last 20 years, we've seen a lot of progress uh, in getting more and more people included in the financial system. But a lot of that progress has been in payment systems. And at the same time, as we've talked about financial inclusion, we've moved to talking about outcomes, financial health or financial well-being. So when you look at the progress that you see in the Global Findex, how do you feel about that progress? Have we made significant progress in making financial systems truly inclusive? Or are we still needing to do a lot of work to make the financial system, system work for those uh, historically excluded populations? So today's financial system leaves out too many people. Um, uh, thinking about women, poor adults, disabled, older adults. Um, and the, the goal is for all ad adults to have access to the wide array of financial services, including bank accounts, savings, insurance, appropriate credit, um, as well as payment services. Um, we're in an interesting time. There's been a surge in account ownership um, during COVID as millions of new adults are receiving wages and government transfer payments directly into an account. Um, and looking forward is how to encourage these adults to safely, uh, you know, within a, a consumer protection framework and regulated environment, access more, a wider array of financial services. Today. You are sort of at the front lines of making the financial system work for a historically excluded population. There are m millions of small businesses across uh, Africa and Europe who have struggled to be part of the financial system. So tell us a little bit more about how Lydia is reaching those populations that haven't been part of the financial system in the past. Thank you, Tim. I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. I mean, for us, you know, our vision is a world where every great business owner has access to free, uh, sorry, fast and fair funding to grow their businesses. And we said to ourselves, how can we enable this? And one of the main things we heard from our customers is, can you assess me based on data? Not the way traditional lenders assess today, which is you must provide physical collateral, land, cash, or machinery. You must provide... Uh, audited financials, three years back, five years projections. And the reality is this ends up excluding a significant majority of business owners. So what we said at Lydia is literally we can assess you based on the data of your business. We're happy to provide a loan to a business as low as $150 and we will give you a decision within one day. And as you grow your business, we can now give you access to better rates that reward you for being a good credit. And so we launched... Um, just over four years ago, and we're approaching now a um, hundred million dollars of worth of loans given to small businesses. Uh, Luce, you know the the population that Tunde is serving in some ways is the you know the the idea that many people have when they think about financially excluded populations, small businesses uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Oxygen Opportunity Fund is working in the United States, where I think there's still a lot of people who would think. You know, we, we fixed that problem. But in fact, everything that I just heard Tunde saying is part of the, the challenge that Axion Opportunity Fund is taking up with small businesses in the United States, reaching historically excluded populations, dealing with people who don't have the credit score, all of that other kind of data for traditional underwriting, trying to figure out how not to just give access to capital, but access to capital that is beneficial uh, to uh, you know, to the the small business owner to enable their success, you know there have always been plenty of people willing to give small businesses loans that extract from them. It's much harder to give loans that build. So, it, what is the challenge of inclusive finance in the United States now, particularly post COVID? Thank you, Tim, and, and great to be here. You know, I'd say that 
uh, there is, there is a number of challenges, but I like to think about what are some of the solutions, right? That both institutions, lending institutions and policyholders can do. You know, one of the things is, is trying to develop, uh, culturally competent products by leveraging data and analytics because not all small businesses are created equal. And particularly the businesses that we're dealing with, which are owned by people of color, women and immigrants, it is important that lenders look at alternative methods of assessing risk so that they can scale lending in a responsible, efficient and effective way. So for example, you know, using bank accounts to understand the business cash flow using alternative data sources to understand bill payment history, and then taking these data sources and several others and helping to build alternative credit scores and algorithms um, that really go beyond traditional credit, beyond traditional documentation, and beyond how much a business has been uh, operating. But that's also why it's important that you know, we hire a diverse workforce that resembles and understands the communities that we're serving and understands how to communicate and market to them. And underwriting every loan for ability to pay, I think it's important that we put small businesses and products and capital that they can afford to pay back. And then you have to also understand that many small businesses are not comfortable accessing capital and resources online but many others, you know, need some handholding through the process of applying for the loan or getting technical assistance. And so really important, you know, especially now when there's so much need for small businesses uh, to get the resources that CDFIs, minority deposited institutions and other lenders support these small businesses to create a combination of digitally enabled high technology, but also higher touch customer service. Uh, so, Tunde, you know, coming back to you on that, um, you know, there is this question of how do we reach people who aren't digitally savvy yet? And how do you get enough capital to those people so that they can grow while still protecting them so that you're not sort of helping them dig a hole that it's too hard to, to get out of? So uh, how, do, how do you approach the um, getting people on board into the digital economy so that they can be included using some of these other data points. Yeah, no, thanks, Tim. I, I thought Lucy's comments on ability to repay is such an important point. Um, so we do a few things, right? So one is we understand that not all small businesses are ready to take on credits. So actually, our very first product is a free invoicing tool where you can invoice your customers for free forever and begin to digitize the payments coming through your business. And for us, it, gives, it solves a few pain points, right? So for the customer, you can begin to track your receivables, get a better sense of who your key customers are. For us, we now start to get more data on your business without um, having to give you credit. And to your point, if you're not ready for credit, putting undue pressure on you. So that's one thing. The second thing we do is we also partner a lot with large enterprises. So we'll go talk to large consumer goods companies, folks in the agriculture space, folks who are doing different things that relate with small businesses. And we'll say, look, let's get credit into your value chain. So maybe your distributors don't need credit, but your retailers, your wholesalers may need credit. And let's start to use their purchasing history with you maybe their invoices back and forth with you and begin to use that to get a sense of the size of the business. And just like how you access a credit card if you're in the States, even if your numbers indicate that maybe you can get a loan of $10,000, maybe we start you with $1,000. And we now see how you can pay that loan off in a short period of time. And then every 30 days, we're re-underwriting you for a new loan. So we're looking at your repayment history for the very first loan we gave you, but we're also marrying that with how your, your company is currently performing. So we can begin to flex up or down the amount of credit we give to you based on your repayment history, based on your ability to repay, and based on current macro condi conditions. That's how we, we think about it. Leora, you don't just do the Findex. You study a lot of... Uh, population sort of on the margins of inclusion, those who uh, are just beginning to get into the financial system. I think, for instance, of uh, digital wage payments in, in Bangladesh uh, as uh, you know, something that you've looked at. But there is always a question, too, with digitization and inclusion, is that many of the people uh, best able to take advantage of digitization 
are the already large, experienced, technically savvy. So uh, say um, the global garment uh, manufacturers are better able to deliver digital wages uh, or digitized wages than the small providers. Um, you know, that does have some risk of not, not closing a gap, but widening a gap. What have you seen in the, uh, the process of digitization of inclusion in places? Should we be worried about digitization growing the gap versus shrinking it? So, so I tend to focus on the absolute numbers. The goal is to grow the number of adults with access to formal financial services. Well, certainly, we've seen a tremendous um, impact of the large global buyers, for example, in encouraging, incentivizing uh, their suppliers to digitize their wages. Um, in fact, you know, Gap, for example, at one point uh, insisted that all their suppliers pay their workers electronically as, as a, a labor for a labor practice. And the hope is that, for example, in our work in Bangladesh, we show that in neighborhoods where workers are paid electronically, we sent in mystery shopper audits, uh, actors into mobile money agents, and we find that overall workers tend to be, uh, there are less, less predatory fees added on um, in neighborhoods where workers are digitized. In other words, there's a spillover effect to the entire community, and those workers become savvier financial customers. Um, so, you know, building, having the uh, larger uh, global suppliers build out the infrastructure and encourage the private sector uh, to build out their agent network is positive and can hopefully encourage the upstream digitization um, to other, to smaller factories, domestic factories as well. Luce, Lira was just mentioning sort of those predatory providers and, uh, you know, Tunde was talking about, you know, building this uh, set of data to be able to better understand the providers. Uh, you know, the, the United States is a place where there's a tremendous variety of financial services and a good bit of predatory uh, uh, providers out there who are very eager to get their hands on data um, to design products that aren't not, not for the good of the of the person that they're trying to serve, but for their own bottom line. Uh, do you encounter some trust issues uh, from uh, these these populations who have encountered these predatory lenders? Um, and and what do you do to help them uh, overcome uh, you know trust that, that isn't just the unfamiliarity, but they actually have experience of of negative predatory providers in the space. I think trust is a huge component in trying to serve underserved populations uh, for a variety of reasons, right? They, they have had terrible experiences with the system. Uh, they have thought they were acquiring one product to find out that the product was not healthy and that it, you know, destroyed or barely destroyed their business. So I think that trust, it's where it starts. And, and the best way to do this really is by working with trusted centers of influence in the communities where these businesses operate and where their families live and be able to gain the trust, understand their needs, what are their challenges and opportunities and being able to work with those partners. So what we have found as an example at AOF is to build credibility and trust within the black community and small businesses. It takes time because we need to build partnerships with center of influence and how we approach our lending, share that, how it's different, uh, that we're responsible, that we have the small business interest and success at heart and at the everything that we do. And so you have to come to this work with a lot of humility, understanding that there is a lot that we all have to learn, but that we are committed to learning it. And I think that the aspect of building community partnerships cannot be underestimated. You know, whether they're bank, non-bank lenders, community organizations, we all need to work together to develop strong relationships uh, with those community partners so that we can effectively understand what are the capital needs of the borrowers, create products that effectively serve the communities that we're trying to serve and help these local organizations with the resources that they need in order to serve the underserved community, uh, primarily those that are led by people of color. Leora, you have more of a, a global picture, you know, from your role you know, with Global Findex, sort of looking at how uh, inclusive financial systems are globally. And there are a lot of differences. In some places we've seen 
uh, uh, the telecoms companies sort of lead out driving a lot of inclusion through mobile money systems. In other places, we've seen uh, traditional microfinance institutions be sort of at the forefront. Uh, in other places, some combination of fintech uh, and others with partnerships with traditional banks. When you think about what regulators and other people involved in the design of financial systems need to know now, given what we see globally and, and where progress is being made and where it's uh, hitting some roadblocks, um, what would you say is the most important thing for regulators to be thinking about in terms of building inclusive financial systems? I agree that building confidence and capability is key um, and trust in the financial system. Um, you know, for one good example is uh, 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 cash on delivery versus online payments. You've seen you know, massive growth in online um, ordering from groceries to Amazon shops in India. It's primarily cash on delivery. And the challenge there is that if the uh, seller can't restock their inventory for four to five days until they receive the payment, um, and to encourage, you know, and so this will require trust on behalf of the seller that will be paid, trust on behalf of the customer that the goods will be delivered, um, and all that requires a more stable, um, you know, so first of all, it requires building out the digital infrastructure, um, and second, you know, from the regulatory perspective, you know, regulators need to, um, you know, ensure uh, the, the safe use, not only uh, safe uh, recourse in the case of errors, but also the safe use of all the data um, being collected um, of customers and so on. Today, you know, picking up on that, um, you know, back to the sort of data question, you know, data is an enabler, but uh, it also carries some risks with it. How do you think about protecting the customers with all of this data that you have and making sure that uh, you know, both you and others in the ecosystem that you exist in are, uh, you know, have customer protection as one of the very first things you think about? No, it's such an important question, right? Um, and particularly for us, because you know we are partnering with the businesses to give them access to credit. And, and Luz made the point around trust. I mean, the reality is, I think for all of us, if you think of the word um, bank, or you know, a lot of it, a lot of times you think of a bad experience, you think of fees, and so there's already a, a level of skepticism. And for us, we also interact with enterprises. So we're talking to some of the biggest brands in the world to say, look, exchange data with us that we can lend to your value chain, which takes decades to build and to gain trust in that value chain. So there are a few things that we do, right? So it's very important that we have a really strong compliance function that makes sure all the data that we are having is housed properly in the cloud. It's very secure. We also make it very clear. We're not selling our data. We're not sharing it with any parties that you don't want us to share it with. And then the second thing that we've also realized as well is it can be as simple as also having a hotline that our small businesses can call into to ask a question. So introduce, introducing empathy into the process. So what I mean by that is, for a lot of small businesses, their first time of taking a formal loan is with Lydia. And so we literally say, look, you have an account manager you can call into to ask a question. What does it mean to take a credit? Is my data safe? How will my pricing evolve over time? And then typically we then see that by the second or third loan, they're then very comfortable um, being able to go through a fully automated process. So we think about it two ways. One is the, the foundation needs to be strong, compliant, data protection, um, and, and adhering to local regulations, but at the same time, introducing empathy and saying, if you need to talk to somebody, there is somebody for you to talk to and also have all your questions answered. The time gets away from us so very quickly. Uh, there's so much ground to cover when it comes to inclusive growth and inclusive financial systems. And so we're already uh, running up some against the time. So. I'm going to sort of wrap us up. I want to give each of you the opportunity to say, here is the number one barrier uh, that we need to confront to keep uh, including people to continue uh, the growth of inclusive financial systems. Um, and if you'd like to add sort of what your call to action to uh, others in the space would be to take on that barrier. Um, Luce, can I start with you? I would say uh, policy is a must in order to make a more inclusive and accountable financial system, uh, building partnerships and creating trust. And my call to action is that accelerating investments in black owned uh, businesses by developing partnerships 
uh, so that we can all together help close the $87 billion gap in small business lending that exists in the United States. Tunde. We all have a very big problem to solve, and it will require all of us to work together to solve it. So it's not us against anybody. It's going to be us plus the banks, plus the regulators, plus the policymakers to say, look, what role do we all play to deliver financial inclusion? And then our big you know, promise is that we intend to deliver a world where every great business owner has access to fair, fast funding and to do so without bias. We will evaluate you based on your data and get you the funding you need to thrive. Leora, and I'm going to add something close to my heart, which is the data that goes into all of this when we think about it. So uh, not only what is the biggest barrier, but also you know, what data do we need to keep making progress on financial inclusion? So regard to data, we need better data. Um, we need uh, also the uh, regulators to encourage banks to collect uh, data by demographic information. We also need data on uh, – we, we know an easy fix is increasing the number of women bank agents and mobile money agents, for example. We need banks to collect data uh, and report on the number of, of staff, for example, by gender. Um, you know, to reach inclusive financial inclusion, we really need inclusive digital inclusion as well. And so certainly something uh, I think we need to invest in is uh, that both customers and uh, financial service providers have access to digital devices and channels, mobile telecommunication networks, uh, all the digitally enabled processes, you know, to name some, just a few of the digital enablers. Um, which can help us set some of the challenges of reaching the underserved customers now um, and in a hopefully post-pandemic future. Well, thank you. Um, thanks uh, for the very engaging conversation, uh, Luce, Tunde, and Leora. We've covered a lot of ground. There is still obviously a lot of work uh, to be done in building inclusive financial systems, but uh, there has been a lot of progress made, as we uh, have touched on here, and there are organizations out there that are actively part of this in building those partnerships to reach uh, these uh, excluded populations. And so I am hopeful about what we see over the next five to 10 years of building on the progress and extending inclusive financial systems to reach more and more. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.